Hi everyone, Matt here and welcome to Simply Strength. In this new series of videos dubbed The Corrupted Man, I will be discussing both real and imaginary figures from past and present to illustrate some of the mistakes one can make in their life with respect to relationships, women and lifestyle. I hope you enjoy it. In this first video, I'm going to talk about the life and times of F. Scott Fitzgerald, one of the greatest American writers of all time, and later focus on one of his most famous creations, the character of Jay Gatsby. By learning from others, both real and imagined, we can forge our own path through life and avoid making the same mistakes as these key figures. Let's get started. The story of F. Scott Fitzgerald is a tragic and depressing one, given his talent, skill and proficiency in writing. A writer of great promise, he became synonymous with the glitz, glamour and decadence of the jazz age and roaring twenties. Sadly, it could be said that he never realised his true potential, and his life was cut tragically short through a combination of ill health and alcoholism. Posthumously, he is remembered as one of the greatest American writers of the 20th century. Here, I'm going to take a retrospective look at his life and times, compiled using the sources below, to illustrate what we can all learn from the man, and hopefully enhance our own existence. Francis Scott Key Fitzgerald, often known as Scott, was born on 24th of September 1896 in St Paul, Minnesota, to Edward Fitzgerald, a wicker furniture made manufacturer of English and Irish ancestry, and Molly Fitzgerald, Nee McQuillan, his mother of Irish heritage. Scott was named after his second cousin, three times removed, Francis Scott Key, who wrote the lyrics to the American national anthem, The Star Spangled Banner, and also after Louise Scott, one of two sisters who died not long before he was born. Only two years after Scott was born, his father's business collapsed, leading to him becoming a wholesale grocery salesman for Procter & Gamble. The family were forced to change locations several times, by way of Syracuse and Buffalo, New York, at different times between 1898 and 1908. During his formative years, he was described as intelligent, with drive, and a keen early interest in literature, with his caring mother ensuring that he benefited fully from an affluent upbringing. However, the frequent change of location during his early school years would no doubt have isolated him and made it difficult to make friends at this time. In 1908, he settled at St Paul Academy after his father was fired from his job at Procter & Gamble, thus forcing a move back to Minnesota. At the age of 13, Scott had developed a real passion for literature and was immersed in the work of Jane Porter, Walter Scott and G. A. Henty. He also achieved his first piece of writing to appear in print at this stage, a detective story called The Mystery of the Raymond Mortgage, published in the school newspaper. He also began to explore literary themes, including the social difficulties of the outsider, no doubt influenced by his early years. In 1911, at the age of 15, Scott was again uprooted due to poor academic achievements and sent to Newman School, a prestigious Catholic prep school in Hackensack, New Jersey. Given the proximity of Newman to New York City, Scott was allowed to explore Manhattan and go to see shows in the city. At school, though, he was unpopular with the other boys and was considered to be aloof and overbearing. This is understandable, given that by now he had no doubt grown accustomed to not settling in, and this would have further compounded his status as a social pariah and outsider. At Newman, Scott participated in the school football team. Indeed, many of us can assert the benefits of team sports for social cohesion and bonding. But this led to further exclusion and isolation after he wrote a poem for the school magazine, The Newman News. It was entitled Football and was inspired by a traumatic incident on the field of play. He was accused of cowardice, and this further contributed to his isolation. So on the one hand, he was trying to cement himself within the social environment at school through sport, whilst pursuing his passion for writing, but unfortunately one was going to have to suffer. In his last year at Newman, Scott would continue to publish short stories in the Newman News. Also, he would meet the prominent Catholic priest Father Cyril Sigourney Webster Fay, a key figure in his formative life, that would inform much of his aesthetic and moral compass throughout his career. Father Fay noticed Scott's talent for the written word and encouraged it, stressing that he should pursue his literary ambitions. Such support from an adult at that time would no doubt have been invaluable and would have boosted his confidence immeasurably, especially given his childhood to date. There is something to be said for boosting a child's confidence, especially a boy's, as they often need reinforcement and direction, particularly during the teenage years when they're finding their feet in life. This is something that truth over everything is spoken about at length, and I completely agree with this. We can all learn a lesson from this phase of Scott's life, and that is to follow your goals and passions relentlessly, ignore the naysayers and go your own way. 
After graduating from Newman, despite low academic performance, Scott decided to stay in New Jersey to continue his development and pursue his craft at the prestigious Princeton University. He took the entrance exams and his fees were paid for with the legacy left by his late grandmother, who died a month before he commenced his studies in September 1913. It's clear at this time that Scott was putting tremendous effort and time into his writing at the expense of his academic work. This is a topic for another time, but school is often a poor barometer for success and does not truly measure academic prowess or accomplishment. At Princeton, Fitzgerald fervently pursued his writing at the expense of his coursework, a recurring theme as I've just discussed. He did try out for the college football team, but was cut on the first day of practice, perhaps a blessing in disguise. Instead, he forged positive relationships with other writers at the college, such as John Peel Bishop and Edmund Wilson, and wrote articles for a number of university publications. He had also progressed considerably from a social perspective, given his inclusion in the Cottage Club, a prominent exclusive eating club, and the Triangle Club, a theatre troupe. However, his goals of social dominance on campus were dashed as a side effect of his poor academic performance. We can see that at this time, Scott was indeed focused on attaining some degree of social proficiency and belonging, no doubt a result of the deep-rooted effects of his childhood. From an external standpoint, we can understand that belonging is fantastic if the people you are with help you grow and vice versa. In this instance, Scott should have continued focusing on his writing and academic pursuits instead of trying to attain some sort of social renown on campus. I believe that this was the result of years of isolation during his childhood and there is something to be said for limiting relocation, especially during a child's developmental years. Due to his poor academic performance, he was placed on probation in 1917 and quit to join the US Army. Fearing his death in World War I with his dreams unfulfilled, he hastily wrote a novel called The Romantic Ego Egotist, although it was rejected by Charles Scribner's sons, and the second to be so. The editor praised Scott's originality in writing, encouraging him to submit more work in the future. It's rare for anyone to succeed at the first time, or even many times of asking, but the lesson here is to continually pursue what you want, especially given what Fitzgerald achieved. Fitzgerald was eventually commissioned as second lieutenant in the army, and stationed at Camp Sheridan near Montgomery, Alabama. Whilst at a country club, he met and became infatuated with Zelda Sayre, the 18-year-old socialite daughter of an Alabama Supreme Court justice and the golden girl of Montgomery Youth Society. They began courting and Fitzgerald proposed marriage, but Zelda was reluctant to marry a man with so few prospects and inability to provide for a family. Now, this is where it all starts to go wrong for him in my opinion. Up to this point, he had been focused solely on his craft, on his work and writing, improving his skills and dedicating all his time to his passion. And as soon as you inject a woman into the mix, everything falls apart. This is not the woman's fault, at least not totally, because some blame must no doubt lay with an all-boy schooling during his formative years and his social isolation and other issues. I'm not from that time, so I can't speculate on the mindset or cultural aspects that were prevalent. But why did he have to put her on a pedestal based purely on looks, that she gained solely from genetics, and not for any degree of hold work. Here he is busting his ass, hastily writing a novel prior to going to the Western Front, wondering if his life will be meaningless should he die, with dreams unfulfilled. And this prima donna socialite simply has to choose the best suitor, based upon purely material concerns, not personality, or even looks for that matter. Nevertheless, Scott and Zelda began an intense courtship, exchanging letters on a weekly basis, and Fitzgerald was aware of Zelda's uncommitted dating of other men at the time. The war ended in 1918 before Scott was deployed, and the proximity to him actually being deployed affected him. This is evident in a number of characters, including that of Gatsby. Subsequently, Scott returned to New York to pursue an advertising career lucrative enough to convince Zelda to marry him. Put another way, he needed a job that paid enough so he could afford her. Now this is prostitution in that the highest bidder gets the prize and gets to have sex with her and own her, as it were. Money in exchange for marriage, sex and the whole nine yards. In fact, he would probably have been better off getting an escort or prostitute, but that's beside the point. It's cringeworthy when you think about it. She doesn't want you as a person, Mr Fitzgerald. She wants your resources. I hate to say it, but Fitzgerald at this time evokes all the qualities of a simp, a thirsty, needy beta male. He should have said, you know what, I'm going to go off 
and make it big and become a hugely successful writer. Find another suitor. I don't need you and I don't seek any validation from you. I'm not playing the game. At this time, Fitzgerald produced copy for trolley car advertisements at Baron Collier by day, whilst at night he worked hard on his fiction, collecting 112 rejection slips during this period. The passion and graft and tumultuous work he was putting in is evident to me now as I read this, and we can all learn from his relentless pursuit of success at this time. Buoyed by some early success in The Smart Set, a literary magazine, Fitzgerald opted to leave his job in New York to finish his novel, This Side of Paradise, at his parents' home in St. Paul. This new draft was more attractive to Scribner than previous efforts, and Maxwell Perkins wrote Fitzgerald on the 16th of September 1919 to say that the novel had been accepted. Harold Ober was subsequently hired to act as his agent, a highly beneficial partnership during Fitzgerald's most prolific years that would also cause Ober some problems from time to time. Contrary to what one might think, the bulk of Fitzgerald's income would be provided by short stories written in between his novels. Upon acceptance of this side of paradise, Fitzgerald cabled Zelda immediately and she then came to New York to marry and live with him. They married on April 3rd, 1920. Zelda's fears about her suitor's solvency seemingly assuaged. Unbelievable! In fact, Fitzgerald had written to publisher Maxwell Perkins asking for an accelerated release, saying, I have so many things dependent on its success, including, of course, a girl. And this is just standout simpery from anyone's perspective. In retrospect, he should have focused on publishing the novel purely because it was his first novel and would have been a valid it would have been validation of his success and the dreams that he'd had as a child putting work into his craft. Anyway, this period coincided with great personal success for Fitzgerald, and he had moved into an apartment on New York's West 59th Street. He was also working prodigiously on his second novel. Zelda discovered she was pregnant in February 1921, and the couple toured Europe taking in many sights and attractions. Their only child, Francis Scott Scotty Fitzgerald, was born in St. Paul on the 26th of October. At this time, Fitzgerald was in his element, producing a large amount of high-quality work in prolific fashion. Indeed, the 1920s were a crucial period in Fitzgerald's development, and he formed close links with the expatriate community in Paris and the French Riviera, particularly with Ernest Hemingway. Indeed, he made several trips to Europe during this time. Hemingway disliked Zelda, describing her as insane, and encouraging Scott to drip to drink so as to distract him from his work on his next novel. Moreover, Zelda had said that their sex life was declining due to Scott having a homosexual affair with Hemingway, leading to Scott deciding to bed a prostitute to prove his heterosexuality. This is an example of the jealousy between a wife and a man's friends, or brotherhood, surrounding him. Fitzgerald and later Hemingway both referred to their writing of short stories as whoring, and it is lamentable that they were often forced to do this to maintain their income. It is sad that Fitzgerald's passion for writing novels was not rewarded with the income that it deserved, and at any rate the grandiose lifestyle he and his wife adopted meant that Scott was often in financial turmoil and required loans from his agent and editor. Only his first novel sold enough to accommodate this lifestyle. The Great Gatsby sadly did not become successful until after his death. When Ober decided against advancing him any more money years down the line, Scott severed ties with his longtime friend and agent. So rather than looking at himself, and particularly his wife's decadent lifestyle, he takes it out on his agent that has already advanced him money and was a key contributor to his success. It's very sad that Scott was blind to this at the time, and this is the goal of this video, to provide a document of just what can happen to a man given a disastrous environment. Although the French Riviera provided Scott with the time and space optimal for writing The Great Gatsby, further stress was placed on his marriage when Zelda met French pilot Edouard Jozanne, beginning a romantic entanglement. By 1924, their relations became difficult and Scott's drinking had morphed into alcoholism, and he gained a reputation as one of the prominent drunks of American literature at the time. He became notorious for his heavy drinking during the Roaring Twenties, and by the 1930s it had badly affected his health. This further compounds the everything in moderation, nothing to excess philosophy that Truth has talked about extensively. And if you check out his channel, 
you'll see videos with this mantra. In 1927, Fitzgerald moved to Hollywood to write a comedy that was never produced, but he began a dalliance with Lois Moran, a 17-year-old aspiring actress. If you take age out of the equation, that's an eye for an eye in my book. After the couple moved back east to Delaware, Zelda expressed a desire to carve out a niche and forge her own identity, as opposed to that of wife of a famous writer, I would suspect. She attempted to become a writer and at the age of 27 a ballerina, practising exhaustively. It's interesting to note that were it not for the efforts of Scott, she would have been unable to invest this time and energy in these pursuits. Be that as it may, she completed a novel called Save Me the Waltz shortly after she was admitted to the Phipps Psychiatric Clinic at Johns Hopkins University for schizophrenia, although this is actually thought to be bipolar disorder and there was a false diagnosis at the time. This was brought on by growing instability, Scott's alcoholism and their turbulent marriage. Scott was furious that she had used material from their marriage to inform the book and he managed to edit some of this out prior to publication. The book did not sell very well and Scott's own semi-autobiographical account of their marriage, Tender as the Night, provides a counterpoint to Zelda's version. Zelda's remaining years were dominated by her mental illness and she required expensive medical care on Fitzgerald's behalf. Fitzgerald's decline was rapid, and on his 40th birthday an article was published highlighting this fall in the New York Post. He battled influenza, alcoholism, tuberculosis, and attempted suicide with a morphine overdose. He was no longer able to depend on his literary abilities, and thus his income dropped significantly. He owed money to his agent and editor, whilst also paying Zelda's medical bills and supporting both himself and his daughter. Some brief work as a screenwriter in Hollywood helped him for a while, but his drinking put paid to that. He also sparked up a relationship with an English gossip columnist called Sheila Graham, something Zelda would not have known about given her condition, probably due to her physical similarity with his wife. Although by this time Ober had pulled the plug on any more money for Scott, he continued to support their daughter Scotty, as the Obers had been surrogate parents to her at any rate. Fitzgerald declined rapidly in health and died suddenly of a heart attack in 1940 at the age of just 44, believing himself to be a failure. The remaining years of their marriage were estranged and full of resentment. Scott maliciously resented Zelda by this stage, blaming her for ruining him, exhausting his talents and cheating him of his dreams. He was bitter at this and the continued success of Hemingway. Zelda herself died in 1948, age 47, when the hospital she was staying in caught fire. In summary, it's a tragedy that Fitzgerald died in 1940 considering himself a failure and his work forgotten, yet posthumously The Great Gatsby is recognised as one of the greatest American novels and one of the best-selling of all time. I'm now going to discuss The Great Gatsby, particularly the character of Jay Gatsby, in that he's one of the most famous of Fitzgerald's creations but also distinctly relevant, as the character encapsulates many aspects of the author's own life. If you are to read the book, or see the film, please pause the video now to avoid spoilers. Gatsby is the titular character of Fitzgerald's masterwork, and he was portrayed superbly, in my opinion, in a recent 2013 film adaptation. Set in the summer of 1922, the novel is told from the perspective of Nick Carraway, a young Yale graduate and World War I veteran from the Midwest, who settles in West Egg next door to the lavish mansion owned by Gatsby. Nick takes up a job as a bond salesman in New York City, whilst renting a small house next to his mysterious millionaire neighbour. Gatsby puts on decadent, extravagant parties, but does not participate in them, sparking several rumours and conjecture about him. One day, Nick drives across the bay to the old money East Egg to have dinner with his cousin and her husband, Tom Buchanan, a man Nick met in college. They introduce Nick to Jordan Baker, a young golfer with whom Daisy wishes to pair up. Jordan tells Nick that Tom has a mistress who lives in the Valley of Ashes, an industrial dumping ground between West Egg and New York City. Not long after, Nick travels with Tom to the valley where they stop by a garage owned by George Wilson and his wife Myrtle, who is the mistress Jordan mentioned. As the summer progresses onwards, Nick gets an invitation to one of Gatsby's parties. On his arrival, he learns that he's the only one who received an invitation and that none of the guests have ever met him. There are multiple theories as to who he is, a German spy, a prince, even an assassin. Nick encounters Jordan and they meet Gatsby, who is surprisingly young and rather aloof. 
Gatsby's butler then later informs Jordan that Gatsby wishes to speak with her privately. Gatsby seemingly takes a liking to Nick, and one day Gatsby offers to drive Nick to town in his, in his expensive yellow car. On the road, Gatsby tells Nick that he's an Oxford man and a war hero, who was born into a wealthy family in the Midwest, who have all since died. Gatsby takes Nick to a speakeasy, where he introduces him to Mayor Wolfshine, a mob boss and business partner Gatsby claims fixed the 1919 World Series. During their lunch, they run into Tom Buchanan, and Gatsby appears uncomfortable around him, leaving as soon as possible. Jordan later tells Nick that Gatsby had a relationship with Daisy five years earlier and is still in love with her. Gatsby had been throwing the extravagant parties in the hopes Daisy would attend. Gatsby later asks Nick to invite Daisy to tea at his house, without mentioning that Gatsby will be there. After an awkward reunion, Gatsby and Daisy begin an affair. Gatsby is rather dismayed that Daisy wants to run away from New York with him, as his initial plan being for them was to live in his mansion. Nick tries to explain to Gatsby that the past cannot be repeated, but he dismisses the remark. Trying to keep the affair a secret, Gatsby fires the majority of his servants and discontinues the parties. Eventually he phones Nick and asks that he and Jordan accompany him to the Buchanan's, where they plan to tell Tom that Daisy is leaving it. Nick is hesitant, but Gatsby insists that they need him. During the luncheon... Tom becomes increasingly suspicious of Gatsby when he sees him staring passionately at Daisy. Daisy stops Gatsby from revealing anything about their relationship and suggests they all go into town. They all leave for the plaza, Tom driving Gatsby's yellow car with Nick and Jordan, while Gatsby and Daisy take Tom's car, which is blue. Needing fuel, Tom stops at George and Myrtle's garage, where George says he and his wife are moving telling Tom he suspects Myrtle is cheating on him, not knowing that Tom is Myrtle's lover. At the plaza, Gatsby tells Tom that he and Daisy are together, claiming that she never loved him. Outraged, Tom accuses Gatsby of making his fortune illegally through bootlegging with his mobster friends. Daisy tells Gatsby that she loved him and still loves him, but she cannot claim that she never loved Tom even once. Tom promises that he loves Daisy and that he will take better care of Daisy, as she reminds him of his faults in their marriage. As Tom tells Gatsby that he is different from them due to his dubious background, Gatsby lashes out at Tom, frightening Daisy. She leaves with Gatsby this time in his car. Later that night, Myrtle rushes out into the street after a fight with her husband about her infidelity. She sees Gatsby's yellow car approaching and runs toward it, believing Tom is driving and had come for her. She is struck and killed instantly. Afterwards, Tom, Nick and Jordan stop by the garage where they see a large crowd has gathered and learn about Myrtle's death. Tom tells the distraught George the yellow car belongs to Gatsby, and he suspects Gatsby is the one sleeping with Myrtle. Nick finds Gatsby lingering outside the Buchanan's mansion, where Gatsby accidentally reveals that Daisy was the driver, though he intended to take the blame. Nick eavesdrops on Daisy and Tom, where he hears Daisy accept Tom's promise that he will take care of everything. Nick is disappointed, but decides not to tell Gatsby since his friend hopes for Daisy's call. Gatsby invites Nick over for the night and tells him the truth about his origins. He was born penniless, his real name is James Gatz, and he had asked Daisy to wait for him until after the war until he had made something of himself. He then met Mayor Wolfsheim and entered his business. The next morning, Nick leaves for work and Gatsby decides to go for a swim before the pool is drained for the season. He hears the phone ringing and, believing it is Daisy, climbs out of the pool as the butler answers the phone. Gatsby is then shot and killed by George, who proceeds to kill himself. Nick invites Daisy to Gatsby's funeral, only to learn that she, Tom and their daughter are leaving New York. The funeral is attended only by reporters and photographers whom Nick angrily chases out. The media accuses Gatsby of being Myrtle's lover and the one who killed her, leaving Nick the only person knowing the truth. Nick realises that he's the only one who actually cared about Gatsby. Disgusted with both the city and its people, he leaves New York, but not before taking a final walk through Gatsby's deserted mansion reflecting on his unique ability to hope and how he lost everything. Back in the sanatorium, Nick finishes his memoir and titles it Gatsby and takes out a pen to retitle it The Great Gatsby. So that's an outline of the plot. And as I said, all of the links will be below in the description box so you can check them out for yourself. But my thoughts on The Great Gatsby, um, the film that is, I've not actually read all of the book, but I really enjoyed the film, is that Gatsby is a tragic character. In a sense, he begins the, the film 
as someone that all of us as men would potentially aspire to be. He's successful. He's built himself up from nothing, from poverty. Um, you know, he's run away from, from home in a sense. He's highly successful. He gets to put on these lavish parties for everyone. And he completely goes his own way. And that's the vibe that I got from the film. But unfortunately, his downfall is a woman and someone that he's obsessing over. But unfortunately, his affections are not reciprocated. And ultimately, this mirrors Fitzgerald's earlier life in that Zelda wouldn't marry him given his financial state. And this is the case in The Great Gatsby. Daisy won't marry Gatsby because he's not a successful man. He's not a rich man. It's got nothing to do with his personality or who he is as a man. Um, and it's ultimately Gatsby's downfall. He, he, beca he turns from an independent, successful man, strong-willed man, um, a player almost, into a simp, such that he takes the blame for Daisy killing uh, Myrtle, and Daisy doesn't even come out with the truth, and she lets him take the fall for it, and that's how much she cares about Gatsby. So we can all learn from these examples, and I'm sure you can see my points in this video, um, firstly from F. Scott Fitzgerald's life and from the character of Gatsby um, from his masterwork. So I've thoroughly enjoyed putting this video together and I think it's going to be quite a successful series. Um, it's obviously taken a lot more work than my other videos, just more general podcasts, but I've had this idea for a long time and I hope you will buy into it and, and really enjoy it. Um, so I'm thinking about potential avenues for further episodes, but I'm going to see how, how this episode fares. So again, I'd appreciate your comments, thoughts and discussion below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you enjoyed this video and would like to contribute to this channel, please check out my Patreon page. Thank you and take care.